Hi, I'm James Valentine. This is Life's Booming. Grab a cuppa and get ready for an amazing story. Are you ready? Here we go. The sun was shining. The coastline was beautiful. And yet, the nerves built up inside me. Lloyd and I were travelling to choose a design for an engagement ring. It was a perfect day, and yet I have this feeling of uncertainty. Was I doing the right thing? We stopped to view the ocean, and I said to Lloyd, I can't go through with this. I need to leave and join the Sisters of Charity to see if that is where I am meant to be. It was a hard decision for both of us to comprehend. But it wasn't a surprise because we had talked about it on and off for a couple of years. But we never spoke of it in depth or for long. But this was the time that we needed to really speak about it. Have you ever been driven by something greater than yourself? A feeling, an instinct, an urge that started out perhaps just as an idea, but manifested itself into something wonderful? Well, this story starts with that kind of moment. This is Sister Christine Henry's story of no regrets. Sister Christine, hello. Good morning, James. <laughs> Look, even in that intro, we've kind of got the story. Oh, you were going to get married, but now you're Sister Christine, you know. Yes. Uh-huh. Tell me a little bit about, about your childhood. Where did you grow up? You know, what was going on there? Okay, I grew up on the heart of the Darling Downs, a little town called Alra. I lived in town, and, um, but my father and mother owned farms around the town. My father was a horse trainer and the, the chairman of the Alra Shire for many, many years. And my mother was a beautiful, caring mum and loved working in the community. So I learnt from my mother and father how to care for other people as I was growing up. And as a child... I didn't like housework very much. I always liked going out with my dad onto the farms and feeding the pigs and milking the cows and things like that. But that sounds very secure, like pillars of the society, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, they were. And very well respected. Yeah. And in the church? Were they in the church? Yes, they were. We would go to Mass every um, Sunday in our Sunday bests and we sat in our regular seat as everyone did in those days. Yeah, and we prayed the rosary on a Sunday night, especially in the winter, around the hot log fire in the lounge room. That sounds like faith is real. You're not just going there because it's expected or it's just what you do. Your parents' faith and your religion was real in the family. Yes, it was. And we went along with our parents. We never questioned my faith in those days. I, I questioned my faith when I I left the family unit to start my nursing because I was a, at an age where I was entering the social life as every young person does. Mm. And for the first time in my life, I was able to choose whether I went to Mass or whether I prayed or whether I stayed out late or what, whatever <laughs> without being, you know, advised to be home by 12 o'clock or be home by 1 o'clock or something like that. Mm. So I was able to make decisions myself and some of them probably weren't the best decisions, but I made them and I learned from them and it's amazing as the years went on in, you know, in my 20s, my values were the same as my parents, really. What about when you were growing up? What were your dreams? What did you think you were going to be when you were a child? Oh, uh, I had three childhood dreams. One that I would be a nurse. Mm-hmm. One that I would deliver 100 babies. 
And I did become a midwife and I delivered over 20 babies and witnessed over 100 babies. So that was my two childhood dreams um, being fulfilled and that one day I would get married and have a half a dozen children. Right. And that was it. And I was, as I was doing my nursing, I did, um, as I said, entered the social life as Every young person does and I went out and I had a few boyfriends and one young man took my fancy and he was living with my grandmother at the time Mm. and so I saw a fair bit of him and then I left to go to Sydney and he sort of came down to see me a fair bit. I think my parents and grandmother thought that, yes, we would end up together and I actually was beginning to think that as well. But on the odd occasion, I had this feeling that maybe it was religious life that I was being called to. And Hmm. this young man, um, Lloyd, and I would talk about it and we would laugh about it and we would move on on our journey together. Right. And Was um, Lloyd Lloyd Catholic? Did he go to Mass and thing? No. No, he, he, he was not Catholic. Can you describe that feeling? It's like it's hard for me to imagine what. A calling like that would be what it feels like, what it sounds like. I suppose that you're here's life, you know, here's your third dream. Yet there's something else. What's the something else? The calling is not easy to explain. It is a deep, deep feeling that there was something more in me that I could do in life for others. I had a feeling that I, for the first time. I didn't need to be with one person and have my own children, but I could be free enough to be of service and care for a lot of people. Hmm. And that is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And to do that, it was to join a religious order. Now, I trained as a nurse within the circle of the Sisters of Charity, and I did my midwifery with the Sisters of St. Joseph in Sydney, and I had connections with other uh, religious orders too, and it was the Sisters of Charity that I was drawn closely to. So you had seen it, you know, like many of the nursing orders ran hospitals, and, you know, we have St. Vincent's, don't we, in Sydney, a very large, major hospital, and so there is that relationship. So you'd seen it. You'd seen what that life was. You'd met those people. You would have met them. Were you educated at Catholic school? Were you taught by the nuns? Yes, yeah, the Brown Josephites. I was taught by the Brown Josephites for the first seven years of my education and then I went to a state school for my um, secondary education. And then I trained with the charities as a nurse. Yeah. And you said Lloyd would talk about this. What did he make of this feeling that you would describe? Actually, we laughed about it because... On the one hand, you know, we were talking about the possibility of marriage and talking about engagement ring, talking about how many children we'd have and I wanted six and he wanted five and and where we would live and then I'd say, well, you know, what would happen if, if I joined the convent? You know, how would you feel? And we'd chat for a few minutes and then we'd laugh about and say, it's it's silly, it's silly. Right. And then when we were going to Palm Beach, which is north of Sydney, it wasn't planned. It just came out that I felt I needed to pursue this and um, I couldn't go through with getting an engagement ring. Yeah, I, I just knew that I had to do it to join the Sisters of Charity and see if that was where I was to go because the feeling was getting stronger mm. there. Mm. I knew that I, I, I loved Lloyd, but this feeling was still very strong there. Mm. I mean, I would have thought that it was reasonably natural to find the compromise there. Of course I can get married and have children and I'll devote a lot of my life to charity work or work within the church and that sort of thing, not to commit to, like you, you seem to be, it was one or the other, get married or join the convent. There was no sense of a yeah. compromise in there? I, I could not see that hmm. at that time. And um, maybe if I looked at it again, there may have been a possibility, but there is a lot of time. You know, like I have the freedom 
all through my religious life, and it's, you know, over 40 years, I have the freedom to respond to a phone call any time throughout the day to respond to a person in need. Whereas if I have children and a husband, I would not be able to do that. Mm, mm. And when I was nursing before I started the Downs and West Community Support, I was on a regular routine in my nursing career. But since I've left that and work with the Downs and West Community Support, I do have even more freedom in my older age to respond to emergencies and call-outs that I, I, I never thought I would yeah, ever have. Yeah. Let's go back to that, those first moments when, when you join. I mean, already at the time at which you join, it's in decline, isn't it? You know, people aren't joining the priesthood or the sisterhood is in the numbers that they want, once were. What was the reaction around the family and, and friends? My mother thought that I was brainwashed. My father was very, very sad, very, very sad. But it wasn't until they could they came down and saw that I was I was very happy that they started to relax. And they then over the years knew that I was the one that could be there for them, you know, in time of need. My brothers and sisters were very, very supportive of my decision. They were surprised, but they were supportive of my decision. Mm. Even though my mum thought that I may have been brainwashed because my dad was so upset, she actually helped me to pack my (laughs) my things to make sure that I was, I had everything that I need and things like that. So, um, wow, what a poignant scene. Yes, yeah, yeah, just yeah. just amazing. And they, they also thought that they must have done something in their married life to turn me off married yeah. life, and they didn't. They demonstrated wonderful family values, and most of them I carry on in my own life now. Mm. And, you know, I just... I, I treasured every moment that I had with my mother and father. Yeah. Where, where, where do you sign up? Like what's the process of that first year or so as a, as a, as a young nun? And this is, are we talking in the 70s or so? Is that when you were doing it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I made contact with the sisters in Toowoomba when I came back from Sydney and told them that I was seriously thinking about joining the um, Sisters of Charity and they spoke to me on a few occasions and then they referred me to the the sisters in Sydney and so I wrote a letter and told them of my desire to join the Sisters of Charity and they invited me to come down, and so I went down and joined the novitiate. So I was a postulant for six to 12 months. I can't remember now. It was so long ago. And for that time, and, you know, I was learning how to be a sister of charity and learning more about the sisters of charity, their charism, their background, how they lived, how they prayed, and things like that. And after a certain time, you then become a novice. So you commit, you know, um, even further. So it's, it's like a progression. As you deepen your faith, you progress along the stages. And it was while I was a novice that I started to have doubts about my decision about joining the Sisters of Charity And I started thinking more about Lloyd and I was in a confused state. Um, Once again, I spoke to the novice mistress at the time and I said, I don't know where my heart and my future rests at the moment because I'm travelling along this path to join the Sisters of Charity and take your temporary vows, and yet I still have these feelings for Lloyd's that I need to either pursue or let go of, and I needed to address that as well. Mm. So she said, well, maybe it is time for you to go home, think about it, pray about it, and so I did. Right. 
I didn't tell my mum and dad that why I was home for an extended time because I didn't want to upset them if I did go back to the convent. I just told them I was home for a long holiday. Right, right. So I did go home. I did meet up with Lloyd and we did go to what was called in those days engaged encounters because he had not dated since I had entered and I wasn't obviously free of him. And so we went to Engaged Encounters, which was an organisation organised by the Catholic Church where couples went to talk about their relationship prior to getting married. And they asked us as a couple, even though we weren't engaged, what life would be like together, what life would be like without each other, And we went to a number of meetings and I think that was probably one of the best gifts that I was ever given in my early 20s was that I could walk away from Lloyd saying, Lloyd, I love you, but I do not need to be with you. Right. You know, it also freed Lloyd and he also realised that, yeah, he loved me, but he didn't need to be with me. He married one of my best friends (laughs) and we remained friends all of their life. Wow. That's a remarkable, like I'm just, I'm struck by how deep your emotional exploration is at this point. And what are you in your early twenties? I would have been numb in my mid twenties by then. Your ability to travel into that level of depth. I mean, in my twenties, I was an idiot. Like, you know, I'm, like I'm, you know, I'm astounded at the sort of the way which you would consider that relationship. And obviously, you know, your feelings for Lloyd were not casual. Like this was a man you could love and marry. You have to grow up. Yeah. When I was young, we had to grow up, you know, and life is very different now. When I was young, my parents taught us how to be independent. I owned a racehorse. I was quite worldly. So you had to grow up and you had to be self-reliant and resilient and things like that. This is a series that we call No Regrets and we're looking at a moment right here, right now, where you've decided, okay, Lloyd, I love you. I don't need to be with you. You go back to the sisterhood. No regrets? Like, did the doubts continue at all or was that the commitment was made? I had no um, doubts or regrets after that moment in time. Lloyd and Sarah came to me a few years later after they married and had their first and only born child. I called him Christopher and Lloyd handed me Christopher and I cried because on one hand I thought to myself, this little baby could have been mine, Mm. but he was perfect, perfect. And I thought, because you don't lose the feminine side of yourself when you join the convent. It remains. But, you know, that was short-lived. And that was a great experience to have the feeling that this little boy could have been mine. It wasn't. And that's okay. Because now I've got many, many beautiful nieces and nephews and grandnieces and nephews and children that call me Auntie Chris. I am filled with so much delight when I drive the cars out onto the farms and the kids run out to me and say, Auntie Chris, Auntie Chris, where's Harry? You know, and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not their um, family member, but they class me as a family member because I'm visiting them so often. So, um, we'll clarify that uh, Harry is your dog, right? Your poodle. Yes, yeah, Harry right. is my constant companion. Okay, we'll find out a little more about Harry perhaps a little later. Let's stay with Sarah, Lloyd and Christopher. There's tragedy here, right? There is. What happened? I saw um, Lloyd and Sarah every year after they married and they came and celebrated my birthday wherever I was. And this year I was down in Tasmania and they flew down and they rang me and said, could you come out for lunch with us? And I said, oh, I'll, I'll just ask the executive director if I could have an extended time off for lunch. And Bill said yes. And so we went out for a beautiful lunch, the four of us, Christopher, 
who was 14 or 15 at the time, and um, Sarah and Lloyd and myself. We had a beautiful lunch, took lots of photos, and uh, I came back. And a few hours later, I got a phone call saying that there was a terrible accident and a young boy, Christopher, was asking for me. So I had to go to the Launceston General Hospital. Christopher was there. His mother had passed away at the accident and Lloyd was critically ill. Wow. Yeah, they were, at, they were on a, um, a bridge that was on a curve and a truck was coming down the hill and actually couldn't take the curve and push the car into the railings of the, um, of the bridge. So Lloyd took most of the brunt of that accident and before Sarah died, she told Christopher to call me. He called me and I stayed with him at the hospital until his grandparents were able to fly down from Sydney and, yeah, so that was a, a tragic accident. And um, Lloyd died? Lloyd died a few days later. Wow. Actually, it was about a week later because we stayed in Launceston um, not knowing what was going to happen to Lloyd. But then when we felt that it was time to bury Sarah, we – um, the parents flew Sarah up to Sydney. They prepared the funeral for Sarah and I came up to Sydney as well. And when we arrived in Sydney, Lloyd died. So we waited a few more days and buried both of them together. And because Sarah and Lloyd were very musical and very talented, Christopher sung Danny Boy at the funeral and there was not a dry eye in that church. And he did it so, so well. Christopher was raised by his grandparents and he has done extremely well over the years, has become a lawyer and um, has got a little family of his own. Mm. You stay in touch. You still see Christopher. I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. I, I, I will do that until I die. So um, Wow. What a, and you know, it's sort of, I mean, people die in car accidents, it happens, but it's just, what a tragedy. What a, you know, the, the bringing the story together of your relationship and what a beautiful friendship that you had, that you were able to, that Sarah could accommodate your friendship, you know, in yeah, that way. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. There was, you know. They, they didn't, well, there was no jealousy or anything on my side and it didn't appear to be, happen with um, Sarah as well, you know. Well, you have become a nun. I mean, that's, that's. <laughs> That's putting you in fairly safe territory. <laughs> well, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, oh. I was delighted for Sarah yeah. and um, Lloyd that they found each other and had a very happy life. Yeah. Very happy yeah. life. Wow. And, and that their last meal was a very happy family gathering mm. and lovely photos. Christopher had beautiful photos of that last meeting, you know, with the four of us and with the mum because I took some of the photos of the three of them. And, and when he came back to Launceston to see me, which was about 12 months later, he wanted to go back to the scene of the accident and I'd never gone back back mm. to that uh, where it happened. He wanted to go back and he bought all the photos. He was such a brave young man, you know, young mm. boy, and to go back there, have a look to see where it all happened and how it happened and all the questions that came up again for him and and we just talked about it and showed the photos and there were tears and there were laughter and he's moved on. He remembers it quite clearly, but he, he's dealt with it and he's moved on and he's got a most beautiful young little family now. Yeah. yeah. Well, Sister Christine, let's look now at then your work as a nun, as a, a nursing nun, I guess. What have you done? What's been the nature of your work? You, know, you said you went into this because you felt as though you could then help. You could help everybody. You could give to everybody. You could follow the, the example of Jesus Christ. What have, what have you done? Okay. Well, when I first joined the Sisters of Charity, I was a registered nurse. So I worked in various St. Vincent's hospitals down the east coast of Australia. I cared for the sick and the dying. And for all those years, I worked in emergency departments in our hospitals. And then in 2007, 
I decided after having major surgery, my contract was coming to a close and I needed another ministry. And we were in the the middle of a the worst drought in in a hundred years. Mm. And I thought maybe I need a change of direction in the ministry. Maybe I could help farmers and those in rural towns during this drought. So I started a Downs and West drought appeal, which I thought would last six months, and that would give me enough time to find a new ministry to help others. During the six months, we raised funds. We got a lot of hampers, which we delivered to farmers in need and people in um, small rural towns that were suffering because they were unemployed or ill um, and things like that, that this was not going to be a quick fix. Mm. So we changed the name to Downs and West Community Support, which reflected more of what we were doing because we were running and organising wellness days for country women, Christmas events for country families so that they could come together, forget all their worries and enjoy a good meal, some fun, a few drinks, entertainment and be gifted with some gift vouchers, lucky door prizes and, you know, a Christmas hamper to take home so they had something for Mm. Christmas. What what were you seeing? What was the scale of the, the devastation? James, the poverty out there was huge. I used to go out and their cupboards would be bare, their refrigerators would be bare, their crops had failed because of no rain or if it did rain and and it flooded, their topsoils were washed kilometres away, mental health issues had risen, suicide, mainly the men Mm. um, and some young, young men. A couple of women ended their lives family breakups, and all due to the stress and the pressures. The family pressures are huge. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just find it unimaginable. I don't know how they do it. You know, they'll go no. through three or four years of drought and then the floods. Like parts of Western New South Wales have gone bushfire, drought, floods, yeah. COVID, mouse yeah. plague. Yeah, you know? yes, <laughs> like, that's right. It's yes. just sort of how do you yeah. go from one to the other? How do you plan? How do you even think? I yeah. better get the crop in, you know, yes. and they get the crop in and then it rains and ruins the crop. Like I just, yeah, I don't know how you do it. No, I don't either. Like, you know, a harvester these days is about a million dollars. Mm. And if you need a harvester and you've got acreage of um, crops ready to harvest and you think, yes, we've got more than a million dollars of crop to be harvested and your crop has already been sold. Mm. You know, and you go out and buy a harvester, then the flood comes, wipes out the entire farm of your beautiful crop, and you think, oh, God, I've sold all the crop, and now I'm in a huge further debt because Mm. I've just purchased this harvester. Mm. The resilience of our farmers is enormous. They live on hope. They love the land. They are carers of our land and they have many, many hardships to endure. What's your relationship then? You know, like I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying about the kind of things you did, the events you organised and the, the direct help that you do. Tell me about your relationship with the farmers. Do they talk to you? Is there something about the nun turning up that sort of opens the door a little? Uh, I think it does. We are a a charity organisation. We don't get any government funding at all, so we're not restricted to time. I can stay there five minutes or I can stay there five hours or five days. It doesn't matter. Mm. I get a sense of if someone wants me to stay longer or shorter. Sometimes it's a phone call, but I've always taken a dog with me whether it was Lady Kenya or Prince Harry, and they are my icebreakers. <laughs> they are very different from a working dog. Yeah. And a farmer will sit on a old log 
and I'll sit down beside them or we'll be walking along the dry paddock bed and they'll kick the farmer will kick a rock and I'll kick a rock and there'll be not a word said and then we'll sit down again and Harry will jump up on the log and walk over and sit on the farmer's lap and I think this will be interesting this will be interesting and then just slowly, 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 the farmers open up. Yeah. Is Harry it, perceptive? Does Harry know? Does Harry yeah. sense the mood? Yeah. Yeah, Harry senses the mood. If um, the farmer is lively and playful, Harry will be lively and playful. If the farmer is quiet, aloof, laid back, that's how Harry will be. If I tell Harry, wake up, Harry will pour at the farmer's face Mm. Mm. and you cannot ignore a little dog pouring (laughs) at your face. Is Harry there? Yeah, Harry's here. Harry's here. Hi, Harry. How are Uh, you? Harry. Does Harry bark? Come here, darling. (laughs) Come here. Come on. Come on, Harry. Come Come in the podcast, Harry. Come and be on Life's Booming. Life's Booming, the dog edition. Hello, Harry. Oh, that is the funniest dog to take to a farm. That is the most unfarm dog. What? <laughs> that is He's so funny. He's beautiful. He's beautiful, but that is a classic-looking poodle. Oh, it's I a poodle, know. right? Yeah, he's a yeah. toy poodle. He's called toy. a party. He's a party <laughs> poodle. <laughs> that is like if you turned up in mini skirt and pink high heels. Like that is <laughs> that is a non-farm dog of the most extreme kind. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, he tries to round up chooks. I would have thought the cattle dogs would bully him a little bit. Do they? Uh... <laughs> no, they. The farmers put the um, working dogs in their kennels when when they know we're coming. Yeah. And if they don't know we're coming, they're certainly in their kennels by the time we get out of the cars. <laughs> <laughs> and do you do you organise that? How how does that relationship work? Do you ring up and say, "Hey, how's it going? I'll, I'll come out tomorrow or something." What what's the? Some people I ring up and organise because they're so far away. Mm. Others I don't um, let them know I'm coming until I'm about half an hour away because I know that they will bust their boiler to cook cakes and biscuits and run into town and get something and I, I don't want them to go to that stress. Right. I'll take out some cakes and some biscuits and, you know, a carton of coffee or, or whatever so that, I bring what we Mm. need to eat for Mm. morning tea, you know, so because they may not have anything and so. Yeah. And you're driving all over Queensland doing this? Southern Queensland. I go out as far as uh, Thargaminda and I do have volunteers. We've got um, no employees at the moment, but we are looking at employing a part-time person to help. So you're doing this on your own? This is basically you and volunteers? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is a... I hate the modern phrasing of this, but how do you measure the impact? You know, like what impact do you think you've had on families through Southern Queensland? It's hard to assess. We can only um, assess by the beautiful comments that we get from some people. Some people we don't um, receive comments from, but we do know that we've had an impact because, you know, their tanks may have been washed away in the floods And now with the rain, you know, a few years later, their tanks are full. So without them saying thank you very much for providing us with the money to buy the tanks, we know that they're not having to buy water. Yeah. Practical help. We try to help in a practical way. Yeah. Sometimes it's a Band-Aid, putting a Band-Aid on a huge sore, but it provides a bit of hope that someone in the city or people in the city prepare to give a lending hand to those in need. Yeah. It just yeah. lifts their spirits, and we do. And, and that's the Aussie spirit, to reach out to those in need. What do you love about it? Tell me what brings you the most joy in doing this. I love the fact that I have the energy and the creativity and the enthusiasm to still be able to reach out to those less fortunate than I am. And if I'm not able to help them through the Downs and West community support, I have a huge network of people 
in different specialities that I can refer individuals to once I have their permission to refer them on. Mm. And so I can be the instrument to get help for individuals because some of them are just too tired to actually ask for help, to yeah. get help. Some of them don't know where to get help. Yeah. Is there a memory that stands out for you? Is there a moment that perhaps captures the nature of the work that you do? So many great memories. But I'll tell you one. I went to, um, this was going back a few years, and I went and stayed with a family and they had no water. So we used to um, have to wash our faces and hands and um, we didn't shower for a few days. And it was summer. Um, It was before Christmas. So you can imagine not showering for a few days. And one day the wife came to me and said, Chris, we're going into the closest town today. Bring your togs, your towel and your toiletries. We're going to the pool. I grabbed my togs and my towel and my toiletries and we went into the local pool and there was a lineup of people going to the pool. Um, Little did I know that they were going to the pool mainly to have a shower. Mm. So we all showered in our togs because they were all open showers. So I went in and I had my shampoo and my conditioner and I had my moisturiser and shower gel and everything. One of the little girls came in with me. She was standing in the shower beside me showering and she ran out of the shower and I heard her whispering to her mum and she says, Auntie Chris has got shampoo, Mum. Can I use it? (laughs) And um, anyway, her mum said, yeah, ask Auntie Chris if you can use the shampoo. So, yep, so she used my shampoo and the conditioner and um, and the shower gel. And then I went outside and I used the um, moisturiser and I didn't realise that they were using sunlight soap. Mm. Here I was coming from the city and I had my shampoo and my conditioner and my um, shower gel and, you know, and they had sunlight soap. Yeah. And you've really got to walk in their shoes to know exactly how they're living and what they're doing without to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, okay, if they can live with washing with sunlight soap and washing their hair with sunlight soap, Maybe that's what I should be doing too. Because yeah. we often make the assessment from afar, don't we? We go, oh, I know what you'll need. Yes. But then there can be that yep. small thing yes. that will also make a huge difference. Shampoo, uh, absolutely. You know. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this was, you know, when I was beginning to go out, um, it gave me an idea on what they actually needed and not mm. what I thought they needed. Yeah, right. Wow. What a life. Yeah. Yeah. What a life. There was a beautiful family out there and they had beautiful long blonde hair. You know, the mother too had beautiful natural long blonde hair and the two children had long blonde hair. And when I went out the next time, they had very short, very short brownish hair. And I said, oh, what happened to your beautiful long blonde hair? And the mother said, we could not keep their blonde hair blonde because the water was that they were using was from the dam, and the dam mm. water is brown. Right. So their, their hair turned brown. Wow. So they actually cut their hair because it was dry, the hair was dry, the colour was not good, mm. Mm. But, you know, things like that. And things like that, that's, I mean, and it doesn't trivialise what they're going through to realise that that's the kind of thing that can be quite crucial or quite painful or the straw that just brings you down, you know, like the the final sort of thing. Yeah, and yet they don't complain about it. They say, okay, well, this is fact. How do we manage this? How do we cope with this? So they go to sunlight soap. If something's broken down and it's not critical that they fix it, they work out how they can actually live without it. Mm. How do you cope with all this? You're, you're, you're giving, 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 you're hearing the stories, you're, you end up carrying the burden of those families and those stories. How do you cope with it? I, well, I'm fortunate enough to be able to come home and debrief with a counsellor 
And so that I don't carry all that burden on my shoulders, I am able to offload it, learn from it, and I'm still learning a lot of stuff about myself and how to deal with the critical issues that people are living with on a day-to-day basis. Mm. And um, I, I guess from a very early age, In nursing, you know, we had to separate ourselves from the issues that patients came in with. We had to be a part of, but apart from, and that was part of our nursing um, education as well. So that held me in higher, you know. Yeah, yeah. How many kilometres do you think you've travelled? Thousands and thousands. (laughs) Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How far have you travelled from the... Girl who's thinking about getting married. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Countless. <laughs> countless lifetimes. Yeah, countless yeah, lifetimes. Yeah. But yeah. I don't get a sense of regret. No, I've got no regrets. I probably would do very little differently um, if I had my life over again. Mm. Yeah. Sister Christine. What a privilege to meet you. I'm, re- I'm really moved. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm getting a little bit choked up because it's a great story and I've sort of been holding it together through the whole thing. But that's it's a really beautiful tale. Thank you so much. I was just thinking, <clears throat> like when we began, I said, what should I call you? You know, Sister Christine. You said, Sister Christine, or then you can call me Christine. I felt no sense of wanting to call you Christine. It's, it's sort of the respect of your position is that you are Sister Christine. That's what you have done and that's what you've offered to uh all these people. It's very funny. I don't. I don't often get moved, and I don't get moved by nuns very often. So, <laughs> oh, James. But that's. Uh, I think. I, I think it was just there was so much in that story that I was just sort of keeping it until this moment, until it finished. But like, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's a very, very moving tale, and your work is absolutely extraordinary. And so, thank you for being part of life's booming. No regrets. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. If this conversation has brought up any issues for you, please call Lifeline on 13 11 14. Thanks for joining me in the final episode of Life's Booming No Regrets. I hope you've enjoyed each episode of the series as much as I have. Life's Booming is brought to you by Australian Seniors and produced by Medium Rare Content Agency. Executive Producers Margaret Merton and Lisa Sinclair. Senior Producer Lauren McWhirter. Producer and Sound Design Sam Phelps. Don't forget to tell your friends in person and online. Like, review and share the Life's Booming podcast. And if you haven't listened to it already, don't forget to listen to Season 1, Grey Nomads, and Season 2, Dare to Date. I'm James Valentine. I'll see you again soon.